Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Global Surgery Grand Round this morning. Uh, just one uh, uh, information is that we run uh, seminars every uh, Thursday at 8.30, and everyone is welcome to join. Uh, so for today, we have two speakers, uh, Dr. Shabana Nagraj and Dr. Godfrey Sama. Uh, we will start with Dr. Shabana Nagraj. Her topic is Applied Global Surgery Research. She is a senior clinical lecturer in global surgery and a clinical researcher with special interest in health systems collaborative. Her background is that she is a postdoctoral clinical researcher with a professional background in pediatric surgery at primary care level. She also has a background in health service research and implementation science. Her PhD was very well based in global surgery, where she did work with uh, community health workers in India. Uh, she's also co-director for the Oxford University Global Surgery course and leads the Global Surgery Day on the International Health and Tropical Medicine Masters course at the University of Oxford. Shobi, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Prof Laku. Um, I just wanted to check, can everyone see my slides? And I, I can't see any of you. <laughs> so, is... Yes. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Um, so thank you very much for that introduction. Um, as Professor Lacou mentioned, I'm going to speak a bit about applied global surgery research, but particularly focusing on the design and development and evaluation of complex interventions in global surgery. And the reason why I'm really passionate about this area is um, that actually a lot of the interventions and drugs that we develop in surgery um, the transition from research to practice often takes, on average, up to 17 years. And of those interventions that are developed, less than half actually make it into routine practice of clinicians, and even fewer make it into policy change. So when we're thinking about looking at the efficacy, whether an intervention works in controlled circumstances, or effectiveness, whether it works in real-world circumstances, we also need to, alongside this, start thinking about implementation and how we might reduce that research to practice gap. So the um, field of interest that I really um, enjoy is implementation science. And this is really about how we get those evidence based interventions and practices into our routine clinical work to improve the quality of healthcare. And um, what I'd like to speak about today is how we might think about some of these implementation issues early on in the research design process and embed those um, principles in the methodology and trial designs and how we might do this using theories, models and frameworks. So the reason why I'm so passionate about this uh, actually stems Back a long time ago, I was working in Malawi and we were visiting all the um, district hospitals in southern Malawi and we came across this village and the villagers told us that the nearest hospital was across this river and um, a very well-meaning American philanthropist had decided to build a bridge across this river to help the people access healthcare. Um, and so the bridge was built with a lot of money and resources and as soon as the grand opening was done, the very next day it was blown up. And I'm not sure if anyone can guess, but who blew, blew up the bridge were these boatsmen who you can see in the corner of the photo. And the reason they blew up the bridge was because they'd actually lost their income and their ability to provide for their families by ferrying people across this river. And this really um, reminded me of a theory that I'd heard about called Islagiat theory, which is it seemed like a good idea at the time. And I think so much of what we do um, seems like a good idea at the time. However, unless we actually think about the context in which we're working and involve all the stakeholders, we can actually um, waste a lot of time, effort and money um, in designing and developing interventions such as this bridge. So when we're thinking about global surgery and thinking about interventions in global surgery, we often think of surgery as just being in the operating theatre, but actually um, it's a system which involves the smaller operating theatres with less facilities, the district hospitals, primary care, the community health workers, the supply chains, how we get the vaccines and the drugs and um, resources to these centres, and then the post-discharge um, care into the community as well as home-based care. So starting to think about surgery as not just um, in the operating theatre, but also as this complex system. So 
thinking about complexity, um, surgical systems are complex because they've got all these different players and we've got all these different people interacting and they're also adaptive. So if we bring in um, an intervention to affect one person's behaviour in that system, automatically other people will adapt in that system to incorporate that behaviour and it occurs within a wider social context. So what I'm really interested in looking at is how these interventions come to be implemented in these complex systems, how they become embedded and eventually integrated into our day to day practice. And if we're thinking about introducing a surgical innovation in this system, it by definition becomes a complex intervention. And so to increase our chances of success, there are certain framework strategies and theories that we can use um, that might help. And some of these have been outlined um, in really great guidance. So the Medical Research Council last year um, updated their new framework for developing and evaluating complex interventions, which recognised the importance of theory within that. And there's other guidance out there. But what I really wanted to talk about today was to think about some of the methods that I've used um, and the theories and frameworks and a process for how we can embed those implementation issues early on in the design process. Um, so my background has really been working with grassroots organisations in global health, mainly in rural India, but also across the world. And one of the first stages that um, I found really important has been to engage the key stakeholders. Um, and just thinking back to the bridge analogy, thinking who should be involved, why they should be involved and how they should be involved in the design process. And then really taking the time to do in-depth contextual work to observe what's happening on the ground, building trust with communities and the people who will benefit or use the intervention and actually think about their needs and priorities. And then there's ways that we can then embed those needs and priorities into the design. And one of those ways is through the use of um, some uh, uh, um, a methodology called human centered design, which can embed empathy into an intervention design. And human centred design is um, more widely a type of participatory approach. And I, I think that these approaches are really pragmatic um, because they actually involve the end users in the design of an intervention. So um, what happens then when you involve the key stakeholders, including the end users, but possibly even policy makers, is that there's this sense of shared ownership from the start. So the intervention is much more likely then to get embedded in the health system and have local leadership. So participatory approaches become very relevant, but also they're ethical and rights based and they become locally embedded because of that local ownership. And one of these um, types of approaches that I've used is um, human centred design. And this really involves um, four key principles, which is it solves the root issues of a problem. It focuses on people so you get that embedding of empathy and it takes this whole systems perspective. So it recognises that an intervention works within this wider surgical system and it involves continuous testing and refinement. So it's iterative. Um, so uh, just to go through a little bit about human centred design, the first stage is really around inspiration and that's really as clinicians we often get our inspiration from our day-to-day um, -day work with um, patients so we actually come up with ideas of what's needed and then we come together in um, the second phase of ideation which is really when um, you get all the key stakeholders together and you have what's called blue sky thinking so um, wouldn't it be nice if and if you had all the money in the world what would you do? And that becomes a really creative approach. And from that, then you can take a couple of the ideas that you think might be implementable to actually the next phase and implement them and pilot them. And then this cycle is iterative. So once that's um, been done in terms of embedding empathy, um, the next bit that I found really helpful is to actually think about how we can use theory to inform our intervention design. And I used to be really scared of the word theory, but actually all it does is provide an explanation of what's happening and it can be used then to predict what might happen in similar situations. And one of the key papers around this and implementation theories is by Nielsen in 2015. And if anyone's interested, I'd really encourage um, you to read that. And one theory I just wanted to mention that I've used is um, around behaviour change um, and in particular the COMBI model, which I'll just talk about how um, that can be used in terms of designing interventions. 
So the combi model um, looks at behaviour change. And so, for example, if we wanted to um, go to um, a hospital and uh, ask them to enact a surgical checklist, um, if it was a very rural hospital, for example, who hadn't had access to this before, um, this particular model suggests that in order for behaviour to change, um, three different um, things need to be in place. So people need to have the physical and psychological capabilities to change their behaviour. They need to have the opportunities both in the social environment and their physical environment to enact that surgical checklist. And they need to have the intrinsic and extrinsic motivations in order to actually complete a surgical checklist. So how this becomes really relevant is that when um, we're doing that initial contextual work is that we can actually ask the key stakeholders about these issues um, and identify the barriers to the capabilities, opportunities and motivations and address that in our intervention design. So once we actually design an intervention, we can make sure that the people enacting the surgical checklist know in terms of their psychological capabilities, why that's important and actually provide them with hard copies or an electronic way of um, completing a checklist in the operating theatre. We can offer them um, the um, physical and social opportunities and then we can overcome those barriers to internal and external motivations. And so by doing that, then our intervention is much more likely then to become embedded in the system. So we've done our early contextual work, we've embedded user end user voices through the use of empathy and human centred design and then thought about how theory can be used to inform the intervention development. And then um, through that theory, we can then think about the mechanisms of action of our interventions. And so thinking about the various intervention components and how they work and then carefully articulating that in a programme theory or a theory of change. And um, I've used the theory of change model because I think that this really looks at sustainable systems change and it looks at that big picture and actually what we want to achieve and when we think about theories of change um, it's really important to start with that end in mind so for example if you want to reduce perioperative mortality and morbidity that might be our long-term goal and then to think about what conditions need to be in place to reach that goal and then planning those interventions to meet those conditions and then thinking about the quantitative and qualitative data that we might need to collect and measure in order to show that our interventions had the intended effect and the timelines and resources involved. And at each of these stages, to always check the underlying assumptions and who to involve at each of these stages. So then you can show at the end during your evaluation the mechanism by which your interventions had its effect, whether that's based on theory or goes beyond your theory, and also the, measure, the measures in terms of quantitative and qualitative data as well. So um, some theories of change are pretty linear, like a logic model, um, but some can actually be a bit more circular and complex as well. So that's just a very quick overview of some of the applied methods. And I'm just going to um, say a little bit of how I've used these um, in terms of doing a project on maternal health care in rural India. Um, so for my DPhil, I was um, I, I um, designed, developed and evaluated a complex intervention for high risk pregnant women in rural India. And this involved in-depth contextual work um, and that involved identifying local priorities of care for high risk pregnant women and taking those principles of human centred design and going on to develop a complex intervention for community health workers called ASHAs, which involved um, different components, which I'll come to, and then piloting that in a cluster randomised control trial of 200 pregnant women across two states and then doing a process evaluation using a different theory called normalisation process theory. So the intervention components were based on that early contextual work and involved um, village awareness program um, targeted training and also providing mobile clinical decision support to community health workers. And this was a complex intervention because it had multiple components, but it was also delivered in different time points during pregnancy and in the postpartum period. So to capture some of the um, mechanisms of action and how this had its intended effect, I developed a programme theory looking at behaviour change and also um, using a theory called normalisation process theory to then conduct a process evaluation of the intervention. And that was really looking at the feasibility and acceptability of the intervention, 
the fidelity to intervention practices and quality of implementation, and then thinking about those mechanisms of change, unintended consequences, and then allowing that refinement, that iterative approach then to occur for the future. So um, I mentioned this um, theory earlier on, but normalization process theory is one of those theories of implementation that looks at how an intervention comes to be embedded and integrated into the day to day work of healthcare workers. And it focuses not on what people think they're going to do or what they say they're going to do, their intentions, but actually the work that people actually do. So it looks at actions and that can be at the individual level and the collective level. And that's why I chose this, because I wanted to see whether actually people were actually using this intervention in the intended way. So normalization process theory addresses three levels of activity. At the micro level, it looks at how people use and oper operationalize the intervention. At the meso level, it looks at how people work together for the goal of implementation. And then at the macro level, it looks at the wider social context in which the intervention functions. And it has four different constructs which actually make up um, why an intervention then comes to be integrated into the day to day practice of people in the health system. So using these four, four constructs, I was able to explain um, using a qualitative approach um, in terms of qualitative data, data collection and then using these four principles in a framework analysis to look at how um, the ASHAs, the community health workers, understood the intervention and the new ways of working. It explained how they negotiated their different roles and changed their relationships but with both other people in the, in the healthcare system, but also the community, and how they actually started to appraise their work and form actual peer groups to support each other. And from that then, I was able to explain those factors at the micro, meso and macro levels that contributed to this intervention becoming embedded in day-to-day -day practice and a change in organisational culture and explained some of the reasons why it was feasible and acceptable through the use of theory. So that's a little overview of um, how that works in terms of um, that project that I've done. And then lastly, I wanted to just touch on um, trial design and how we can think about implementation while we're designing clinical trials as well. Um, so there's um, a, a, a lovely paper which looks at these effectiveness implementation hybrid trial designs. Um, so type one um, hybrid trials really concentrate on what we've always concentrated on, which is effectiveness, but start to think about how potentially we can start thinking about implementation strategies in the real world. And type two actually evaluate not just the effectiveness of an intervention, but also those implementation strategies alongside the effectiveness. And type three, focus on the implementation strategies and the clinical outcomes are secondary to the implementation strategies in terms of outcomes of those trials. So um, these are just some of the ways that we can think about applied global um, surgery research, thinking about how we can start to bring in implementation and those um, narrow that gap between developing an intervention and getting it embedded in practice. So we reduce that time from evidence-based, um, proving an evidence base to actually getting things into the real world. So just to summarize, um, co-designing co complex interventions with the end users can help with these um, problems of implementation and sustainability. And theory can be used to design and explain how an intervention works. And taking that time to actually think about what the intervention is and how it has its mechanism of effect can actually start to improve those chances of evaluating the complex intervention and thinking about which components actually are important to take forward and will make that refining process easier. And then finally, um, designing trials to evaluate implementation strategies alongside clinical outcomes. I'd just like to end um, with a quote which um, was from an NGO I used to work with in the Himalayas, which is, I think, embodies this design process, which is go to the people, live among them, learn from them, love them, start with what they know, build with what they have. But with the best leaders, when the work is done, the task accomplished, the people will say we have done this for ourselves. And I think that that's what we're trying to achieve through this process, which is to actually get that local ownership, that local um, embedding and leadership. And so when we 
um, move away, that, um, that it's the intervention is completely owned and integrated into a system. So thank you very much. And if there's any questions, really happy to take those. Thanks. The second presentation is um, by Dr. Godfrey Sama Filippo. He's a research and patient outcomes coordinator for the College of Southeast and Central Africa, but he's also a joint senior clinical researcher between the Mohimbili Hospital and us in Oxford. He's going to talk to us about a journey undertaken by families to access general surgical care for children at Muhimbili National Hospital in Tanzania. It's a prospective observational cohort study. So Dr. Sama is a medical doctor and public health specialist and a global surgery researcher. Uh, he also leads the children's surgical research at Muhimbili National Hospital with the University of Oxford. He has a master's of global uh, surgical care from the University of British Columbia and he's a chief research coordinator for cancer collaboration, leading a number of multidisciplinary international collaborative cancer research projects in Tanzania. Uh, he has uh, global surgery training, uh, advocacy partnerships, and he also has um, experience in uh, implementation science and research. Uh, Godfrey, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Prof. Kokila, and also thank you everyone for having me to this uh, grand round. So as uh, Prof. Professor Kokila have already introduced, I will, I will take you through the study that we did uh, titled A Journey Undertaken by Families to Access General Surgery in Surgical Care for Their Children at Moimbili National Hospital. This was a prospective study and uh, I will be presenting this on behalf of the team who will uh, work together on this project. So I will take you through this outline uh, just to give a background of all, uh, I mean, this uh, situation that you already know that uh, approximately 94% uh, of the global population are lacking access to timely surgical care. And the majority of these are in the low and middle income countries, uh, which can, uh, Tanzania is also included, but also uh, majority are children. And out of this, uh, approximately 88 million individuals are suffering uh, catastrophic health expenditures when they uh, look for this um, surgical care. And in the country like Tanzania, when um, there is that such a gap in trying to implement uh, interventions, I think there is uh, a need of uh, evidence. So, but the, in terms of children, we, we really lack enough uh, data the contextual data to on, 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 on access to children's surgical care in, in the country. And uh, Tanzania, uh, just as uh, short background about, about the country, it has over 70 percent of its 6 million, uh, 60 million population residing in rural areas. And this uh, depends mostly on the district levels uh, hospital to access surgical care, which always doesn't uh, necessarily uh, address children's surgery. So uh, we have few centers like Mohimbili, which uh, have relatively larger capacities in terms of um, uh, 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 provision of surgical care. But Mohimbili, it has mainly been because of the collaboration of the University of uh, 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 Oxford. So they, uh, even uh, with this existing collaboration and the care that is existing, but there is there is no uh, data in the country. There were no data, at least in the country, which were exploring the journey of the patient uh, coming to 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 seek care at Mohimbili. And uh, later I will explain why I, I I wanted to explore the journey. But um, we aimed to assess this journey from the time that they uh, have a surgical condition to the time they access uh, adequate care. So specialized list care at Muimbili National Hospital, and we were trying, to, we were guided by the, the Lancet Commissioner indicators of timeliness, uh, safety, and cost cost burden. So uh, we did this study at Muimbili National Hospital, which is here. Uh, this is a specialized uh, hospital which provides a number of uh, uh, children's surgical care, but also. If you see the, situ the, the, the where it is located, it is in the eastern part of the country, but it receives uh, patients from all over the country. 
So the, our study, we, we randomly included all the patients who were seeking surgical care at this center, and we included both elective and non-elective uh, uh, non surgical patients with the age uh, 11 or, or younger and who had consented. So we excluded this, this, uh, the children who were seeking specialized uh, surgical care, for example, uh, neurosurgical or orthopedic or plastic and, uh, and cardiac, because these are, are treated by a separate center in the, in, the, in the same institution. So then we followed up this patient for 30 days uh, post their uh, post surgery. So we use uh, clinical visits when they they come for uh, clinical visit, but also for those people uh, uh, and patient who are not able to come back to Moimbili, we use phone call for following them up. And uh, we use Swahili to do our data collection. We collected a number of data from demographic uh, uh, times to seeking care to reaching care, and also the the, the type of uh, uh, transportation that they used. But we were also interested in learning about uh, their, their, their financing for, for, their, for their care. So we, we look into those who had uh, insurance and who didn't have. And also we try to explore also the, the out of uh, of, of pocket expenditure. So the distance where we estimated using the, the time, uh, the place of location uh, where the, the, these uh, children were living. And we used Google Map because it was a bit challenging to, to use other means of uh, uh, distance uh, estimation. So also for those who are followed up in the ward, because we sometimes they, they, they could stay for long in the ward, so we use the case report form, which was concurrent, was, was, was concurrent with the clinical information that are collected. And we use a Cleven Dindo system to, to, to classify their, their complication. And this data, uh, the study itself was uh, uh, received institutional review board from the MNH, Mwimbili National Hospital, and we used REDCAP for, for data storage. So the data collection was actually led by uh, two medical doctors who are working as um, 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 res uh, registrars in the department. And we described our data using proportions, median and data quantile range, as I will explain, using also Man Whitney at, and Kuska Wills test, as well as Fisher's exact test. And you, we used the multiple linear regression to try to understand whether there was uh, any association uh, between the factors that we, uh, we were interested in. And the, the data analysis was done using uh, Stata and we, uh, we used Strobe for reporting our, our findings. So in summary for, for, for the results, we this study, uh, we accrued a total of 144, uh, 54 children with a median age of 36. And majority of these were coming from the coastal zone. This is the zone where the hospital is located and the majority were male. And uh, most of these children came for um, elective surgery. And uh, this was almost 92%, uh, percent, but my most, most, mo the most commonly performed procedure was uh, anorectal malformations. So a little bit of the safety data that we we we, we collected, we the, it, uh, we had an incidence of 10% uh, for these children who were receiving care. We combined both for over the whole time of uh, follow up, the 30 days uh, post surgery, and the post operative complication was uh, uh, for those who underwent elective surgery. Where, where more, as you can see from, from, from this uh, um, uh, graph, um, this table, but also there was a greater pro uh, pro proportion of children who had mild com uh, complication. We didn't have severe, uh, so most, a, a few had moderate and um, uh, mild, but also using the Cleven Dindo uh, classification, uh, there was more of those who uh, in the elective uh, arm but even for this one, majority fold into, into class one and two. So individual in the emergency surgery were more likely to have post, uh, uh, post operative surgical site infection. And I think this can be explained by a number of uh, reasons, um, a number of reasons um, that we encounter in the setting. So when we looked into the uh, demographic of these children, majority were referred from other centers. Majority came from the regional hospitals 
a few from district hospital and health center as well as dispensary. Uh, but we had a few who had self-referred. But looking into this, we see that this is the normal way. We, we expect that for Muhimbili, which is a specialized hospital, that the referral system goes from the lower level to high level. So the, the data was uh, concurrent to this, uh, the, 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 the logistics and also the infrastructure, how it is designed in terms of referral status. Um, but so out of this, 80% were referred from who were referred from uh, other facilities. 63 came from the regional hospitals, and I we highlighted this because in the regional hospital is the where we expect at least children to have some level of surgical care as compared to district level where we expect that they only have those um, essential surgical care. But it was um, for, it was a bit challenging for us, and we when we tried to explore some more some of the reason which so this was from the patient. They said it was mostly lack of uh, expertise. That is the reason why they were referred, and also lack of necessary equipment equipment to, to provide uh, children surgery. And of these, we, we most of the children who received care at the Muhimbili National Hospital. Uh, really required specialized uh, uh, care, but we had uh, almost 20.8 uh, children who had conditions like hernia, appendicitis, and lipoma, who can who could have received care in other uh, centers, especially in the lower level of care. And when we looked into the time uh, to receive care, uh, we 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 noted that. The, if you, you, you we took we took the two hour access to surgical care, most uh, almost 68% uh, were able to reach the referring hospital, and this is explainable. It, it can be explained because this is close to the patient, and only 31% were able to reach MNH um, within the two hours uh, required uh, or recommended by the, the Lancet Commissioner. So the median was almost 1.5. To referring um, hospital and four hours to to MNH. So this was quite um, alarming for us. And when we looked into some of the uh, economical factors uh, related to surgical care, we noted that there was a huge amount of out-of-pocket expenditures. And even though this, the majority of children had um, uh, health insurance, we came to note that most of those who had health insurance, almost 78%, uh, they received this. I mean, they were receiving elective surgery. And we, we, the, the reason why most of the children who come for elective surgery, they will be uh, required to have that. But for those who came for emergency surgery, their the, the the health insurance uh, coverage was uh, similar to the general population. So around 30%. And I think this is the reason why it, it uh, uh, our, our finding also said that even with the higher level of um, health insurance coverage, but there, there was a very weak uh, evidence that this, um, I mean, having health insurance really protected these children to, from the out-of-pocket uh, health expenditure. But also we noted that out-of-pocket health expenditure uh, loss was significantly higher for those who referred who were referred through the another system as compared to those who came directly to the to the to the to the to, to MNH. So our study had uh, one limitation. So mostly it was because we not we, we we did the study in the MNH, which is already a specialized hospital. We didn't explore the situation in the regional hospitals, but this is the area that in the future we want to explore uh, before getting into the designing what intervention can be done and inform the policy. So we have, um, we, we, we first want to look into the regional hospitals and also visit the Ministry of Health to, to try to understand the, the, the pathway challenges in these regional hospitals, but also the Ministry of Health, if there is any um, any efforts in trying to, 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 to I mean, uh, correct this situation, but also we wanted to also hear from the patient because this was only um, a quantitative study, but we, we thought maybe if we have, uh, we hear the patient's voices that we can also strengthen our, our finding and we can be better uh, in, a, in a better place to design the intervention that will be needed 
to, to address the, uh, access to ch children's surgery. So in conclusion, uh, this was the first report for, for, for us in Tanzania to try to explore the safety, timeliness and affordability of surgical care for children. And we noted that majority were able to access surgical care, mostly in the regional hospitals uh, within the two hours and not in this a specialist center like MNH. And also uh, pediatric surgery led to considerable out of pocket. And this was not um, uh, any difference between those who had insurance or not. And there is so there is a great need for uh, still strengthening surgical care system in Tanzania. And I think uh, this is this was an important study for us in trying to to learn that we can have this evidence before uh, we think of further implementation uh, in the future. So we we we, we like to acknowledge uh, the Oxford University grant uh, scheme for for their funding through the uh, Global Challenge Research Fund, which funded for the uh, funded this research, but also the Children Research Fund from the Hag uh, Greenwood family. But also I would like to uh, thank the co-investigators on, on, on this uh, study led by Dr. Zaitun Bohari, who is the um, consultant pediatric surgery at Moinvili and Professor Kokila Laku, who have really been uh, crucial into this uh, initiative. But also in the special thank you, thanks uh, to Professor Kokila for, for her mentorship for a long time. We have been having this co uh, collaboration for over now 20 years with the Mwimbili National Hospital. So I thank you all and this um, the end of our presentation probably